Muscarinic antagonists are drugs that block the effects of acetylcholine. Their effects mimic sympathetic nervous system actions because the parasympathetic system is being turned off. Some have the common ending tropine, but many do not. Unfortunately, you'll just have to memorize the names. Atropine is the prototype drug. It has a long half-life, and it crosses the blood-brain barrier. Homotropine and tropicamide are similar drugs, but with shorter half-lives, and therefore are more useful in certain clinical situations. They all produce medriasis and psychoplegia, and can be used clinically to dilate the pupil during fundoscopic exam. Psychoplegia is the paralysis of the ciliary muscle, resulting in a loss of accommodation. Atropine can also be used to treat bradycardia. Benztropine is a muscarinic antagonist that is used for the treatment of Parkinson's disease. The mnemonic Park My Benz is helpful for this one. Scopolamine also acts in the central nervous system and is typically used for motion sickness. Ipratropium is used to reduce bronchial secretions in the treatment of asthma and COPD. It's often given in combination with albuterol. Remember the mnemonic I pray I can breathe soon. Oxybutynin and glycopyrrolate are used to reduce urinary urgency and mild cystitis and bladder spasms. Methscopolamine, parenzepine, and propantheline can be used to reduce GI secretions in the treatment of peptic ulcer disease. As I briefly mentioned before, atropine is a muscarinic antagonist. Let's discuss the details now. It is easy to remember atropine's effects if you think of it as the opposite of the parasympathetic system. In the eye, it causes pupil dilation and psychoplegia. In the airway, it decreases secretions. In the stomach, it decreases acid secretions. In the gut, it decreases motility. And in the bladder, it decreases urgency. Atropine toxicities can be remembered by the following mnemonic. Hot as a hair, dry as a bone, red as a beet, blind as a bat, and mad as a hatter. In other words, increased body temperature due to a decrease in all secretions including sweat, rapid pulse, dry mouth, flushed skin due to peripheral vasodilation to compensate for increased body temperature, psychoplegia, constipation, urinary retention, and disorientation. To remember disorientation as an atropine side effect, you can think about the association between Alzheimer's disease and decreased acetylcholine. Certain populations are more sensitive to these side effects, such as the elderly with acute angle closure glaucoma, men with BPH suffering from urinary retention, and infants who are particularly susceptible to hyperthermia. All sympathomimetics stimulate the sympathetic nervous system, though they do not all stimulate the same receptors. The key to this section is knowing which drugs stimulate which receptors. Now is a good time to go back and review the functions of the alpha and beta adrenergic receptors. Like the cholinomimetics, there are two general classes of sympathomimetics, the direct and indirect agents. Let's start with the direct agents. At high doses, epinephrine stimulates alpha-1, alpha-2, beta-1, and beta-2 receptors. However, it is relatively selective for beta-1 receptors at low doses. It is used clinically to treat anaphylaxis, open-angle glaucoma, asthma, and hypotension. Norepinephrine primarily stimulates alpha-1 and alpha-2, and also stimulates beta-1 to a lesser extent. It does not stimulate beta-2 receptors. It can be used for hypotension, but it can significantly decrease renal perfusion, especially when given in conjunction with NSAIDs, because there is increased renin release stimulated by beta-1 and vasoconstriction induced by alpha-1 without any compensatory vasodilation effect of beta-2. Isoproteranol is an isolated beta agonist. It stimulates beta-1 and beta-2 equally. It can be used to treat AV block, but is rarely used clinically. Dopamine primarily stimulates D1 and D2 receptors at low doses, beta receptors at medium doses, and alpha receptors at high doses, making it both inotropic and chronotropic. It can be used to treat shock and heart failure. It is especially useful in the treatment of shock because it raises blood pressure without reducing renal vascular flow. Recall that D1 receptors relax renal vascular smooth muscle. Dobutamine primarily stimulates beta-1 receptors and is therefore inotropic. Phenylephrine primarily stimulates alpha-1 and has a lesser effect on alpha-2. It can be used to dilate pupils without producing psychoplegia because there is no sympathetic innervation for accommodation. Its vasoconstricting effects also make it a useful drug for treating nasal congestion. Metaproteranol, albuterol, salmeterol, terbutaline, and ritadrine are all selective beta-2 agonists. Metaproteranol, albuterol, and salmeterol are used in the treatment of asthma. Metaproteranol and albuterol have short half-lives and are used for acute attacks, while salmeterol is used for long-term treatment. 
Terbutaline and ritadrine are typically used to prevent premature uterine contraction during pregnancy. Side effects of these meds can include hypotension at high doses due to the vasodilatory effect of beta-2 receptors, as well as muscle tremor. One way the USMLE likes to test these drugs is with blood pressure and heart rate graphs. Consider norepinephrine with alpha-1 and alpha-2 greater than beta-1 effects. Alpha-1 raises the diastolic pressure by increasing peripheral vascular resistance. Beta-1 raises the systolic pressure by increasing inotropy. The body compensates for increased blood pressure by decreasing heart rate. This is known as reflux bradycardia. So even though it might seem that beta-1 stimulation should increase heart rate, the bradycardic reflex overcomes this and produces an overall slower heart rate. Now consider isoproteranol, an isolated beta agonist. The beta-2 effect lowers the blood pressure with the decrease in diastolic greater than the decrease in systolic. The beta-1 effect increases heart rate and temporarily increases systolic blood pressure. However, increased heart rate reduces ejection volume and therefore the steady state systolic blood pressure will be slightly lower than it was prior to administration of isoproteranol. The increase in heart rate is significant because in addition to the beta-1 effect, there is also an element of reflex tachycardia due to the decreased blood pressure. Moving on to the indirects and pathomimetics. These agents act either by increasing the release of stored catecholamines or preventing their reuptake. They do not directly stimulate adrenergic receptors themselves, which is why they are indirect. Amphetamine releases stored catecholamines and prevents reuptake and is used to treat ADHD, narcolepsy, and obesity. Ephedrine releases stored catecholamines and is used to treat nasal congestion, urinary incontinence, and hypotension. Cocaine prevents catecholamine reuptake, causing vasoconstriction. It can lead to vasospasm, however, increasing risk for myocardial infarction and stroke, and is somewhat unique in that it is also a local anesthetic. Sympathoplegics are drugs that inhibit postganglionic functioning of the sympathetic nervous system. Clonidine and alpha-methyldopa are essentially acting alpha-2 agonists. Recall that alpha-2 stimulation actually leads to a decrease in sympathetic outflow, so even though these drugs stimulate alpha receptors, they actually inhibit sympathetic nervous system function. These drugs are used to treat hypertension, especially in patients with renal disease, because they do not decrease blood flow to the kidneys. Let's talk about alpha blockers now. Non-selective alpha blockers include phenoxybenzamine, which is irreversible, and phentolamine, which is reversible. The primary application of these drugs is treatment of hypertensive crises from catecholamine surges caused by pheochromocytoma, MAO inhibitor plus tyramine interactions, etc. Side effects include orthostatic hypotension and reflex tachycardia. Alpha-1 selective drugs typically end with zosin and include prazosin, terazosin, and doxazosin. The primary application of these drugs is treatment of hypertension and urinary retention in BPH. Side effects include first-dose orthostatic hypotension, dizziness, and headache. Mirtazapine is an alpha-2 selective drug that is used to treat depression. Blocking alpha-2 leads to increased outflow of catecholamines. Toxicities include sedation, increase in serum cholesterol, and enhanced appetite. The concept of epinephrine slash phenylephrine reversal is important when talking about alpha-blocking drugs and is commonly tested on the USMLE. These graphs demonstrate the effects of an alpha blocker such as phentolamine on blood pressure responses to epinephrine at the top and phenylephrine at the bottom. The rise in blood pressure seen with epinephrine is reversed in the presence of phentolamine. This is because phentolamine blocks the alpha component of the epinephrine effect, the vasoconstriction component, leaving only the beta-2 response, the vasodilatory component. Phenylephrine also initially increases blood pressure due to its alpha effects. However, it is a pure alpha agonist, so when phentolamine is applied, the blood pressure is normalized, but there is no hypotensive effect as with epinephrine because there is no beta component to phenylephrine. These details are important to know because a lot of Step 1 farm questions will test your knowledge of what meds act on what receptors and how different medications can interact with one another. Beta blockers are an important class of medications that must be learned well for the exam. It is important to know which are selective and which are non-selective, which are partial agonists and which are not. Indications for the use of beta blockers include hypertension, for which beta blockers decrease cardiac output and renin secretion due to beta-1 blockade on juxtaglomerular cells. Angina pectoris, for which beta blockers decreases heart rate and contractility, resulting in decreased oxygen consumption by cardiac tissue. 
Myocardial infarction, for which beta blockers have been shown to decrease mortality. Supraventricular tachycardia, or SVT, which can be treated with propranolol and esmolol, class II antiarrhythmics that decrease AV node conduction velocity. Congestive heart failure, for which beta blockers slow progression to chronic failure, and glaucoma, for which timolol is effective because it decreases secretion of aqueous humor. Beta blocker toxicities include impotence, exacerbation of asthma due to blocked beta 2 receptors, adverse cardiovascular effects such as bradycardia, AV nodal block, and congestive heart failure, and CNS sedation. Furthermore, beta blockers must be used with caution in diabetics because they worsen blood sugar levels and can blunt symptoms of hypoglycemia. Beta blockers can be classified based on their selectivity. Beta 1 selective antagonists include ataxolol, esmolol, atenolol, and metoprolol. You can remember these as a beam of beta-1 blockers, since a vertical beam looks like a 1. Beta-1 blockers are good for patients with comorbid pulmonary disease because beta-2 blockade leads to bronchoconstriction. Non-selective antagonists have equal effects on beta-1 and beta-2 and include propranolol, timolol, natolol, and pindolol. Most of these have a first letter of N or later in the alphabet for non-selective. An alternative mnemonic is please try not being picky. Non-selective alpha and beta antagonists include carvedilol and labetalol. And finally, partial beta agonists include pindolol and acibutilol. Recall that partial agonists have a stimulatory effect when used alone, but have an inhibitory effect when used in combination with a full agonist.